Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and you're looking at the beautiful Kepler telescope that was just shut down only a few days ago from when I'm making this video. Today we're going to talk about um, a question that was actually asked by a few people. Why can't we just refuel this thing and have it continue doing its mission? And in a sense, it's a valid question. Why can't we just send a spacecraft to refuel it? Uh, because we've done many missions to Hubble telescope and uh, we've even fixed uh, certain things that weren't working on Hubble. So why not Kepler? Let's talk about this and let's actually explore this mission in a little bit more detail. I'm going to show you some tools that you can use as well. And welcome to What Math. And I really wanted to start this video right here. This is Kepler-10. Now, this incredibly looking planet, um, unofficially nicknamed Vulcan, is also the first ever uh, terrestrial planet discovered by Kepler, basically just a little bit after it started its mission. So, in a sense, it's almost like the legacy of Kepler right here. Kepler-10, otherwise, is not really a particularly interesting planet. It's actually a little bit too close to its parent star, and so it's, I guess... You can call it toasty. It's very, very hot here. As you can see, it's even emanating uh, some of its material from the planetary surface because look how close it is to its parent star. But this also demonstrates how prolific this telescope was um, throughout the years of its functionality. There were two missions. There was a Kepler-1 mission and the K2, Kepler-2 mission that overall found close to about uh, 2,800 different exoplanets. Um, essentially, approximately 70% of all exoplanets discovered were found by Kepler. But to answer the question of why can't we just refuel it like we did with Hubble, why can't we just put more materials into it and make it function longer, we need to take a look at NASA's eyes uh, visualization and I'm going to show you why it's not such an easy task. Actually, first of all, Let's find the Hubble telescope, um, which should be somewhere around here. There it is. HST stands for Hubble Space Telescope. And um, we're just going to take a look at its orbit. And it's a little bit difficult to see it right now because it's actually kind of dark. So we might as well advance time a little bit. So it orbits around the planet and reaches the part where it's a little bit brighter. And so there you go. So that's Hubble. It's a relatively large telescope. It's about 13 meters or... I guess just over 40 feet in length. Um, it's basically the size of a small bus. And this right here is about two and a half meters, uh, which is, uh, what is it, like eight feet? And a um, large telescope and was launched in, back in 1990. So it's actually the oldest and the most well-known telescope uh, that is still functioning today. Um, but there were at least five missions to either repair this telescope or add more materials to it or upgrade it because it was designed to be very modular and it was also designed to be refueled at any time. Now, why wasn't Kepler designed in such a way? Why was not Kepler designed in a way where we could just easily send more fuel to it and, well, have it function definitely, just like the Hubble telescope? And to answer this, well, we first have to go a little bit away from this particular orbit. As a matter of fact, I have to go much, much farther away, even away from here and even here. And I think the easiest way is to actually just reset my camera to show you that unlike Hubble, Kepler is actually in its own orbit around the sun. It's in a uh, heliocentric orbit. And if you advance time, um, you'll actually start realizing that the way it orbits right now is it actually constantly falls a little bit behind Earth and moves farther and farther away. When it was just launched, um, it was actually very, very close to Earth. Over time, though, it actually fell behind up to here, this point, and will fall even more behind with time. It will take it approximately 40 years to get back to the same sort of region of space where Earth is. So, technically speaking, in 40 years, we do have a chance to refuel this telescope. So in other words, uh, we can't really refuel it right now because it is just way too far away and the mission to refuel this telescope would cost way, way more than literally building a couple of new ones and just launching them uh, from Earth again. Uh, so if we were to try to launch a refueling mission, 
we would need to have a lot and a lot of preparation. It would actually have to be a very heavy craft um, and it could not possibly be a manned mission. So it would have to be a mission uh, that's automatic, uh, some sort of a artificial intelligence based um, refueler. And we just don't have that. And the technology is just not there yet. But if we wait 40 years and it's near us, we could technically refuel it, except that, as you can see, it was actually not designed in such a way. It was designed to be an enclosed telescope that only has uh, one single fuel tank that just gets fuel um, injected before the mission and then it gets sealed up and you launch it and it works for a few years and then you kind of abandon it. So in that sense, Kepler unfortunately doesn't really have any means of being refueled unless you break into it physically and try to uh, reach the tank that way. However, this could actually break the telescope. And despite this telescope being a relatively new and a relatively uh, recent sort of technology when it comes to telescopes, um, it's much cheaper and much easier, like I said, for us to just launch a new one than to try to uh, re-enable this one. By the time this telescope actually gets close to our planet Earth, uh, in 40 years that is, the technology will most likely have advanced to the point where we're going to have much, much better telescopes, so refueling this is just not going to be even a question. So in that sense, this telescope definitely served its purpose and it actually discovered a lot of new uh, planets, exoplanets specifically. But despite its apparent success, um, it's actually still much easier to just create a new telescope with new technology and to launch it completely from scratch from planet Earth. Now, the other thing about uh, Kepler telescope is that it actually collected so much data from about 150,000 stars that it's looking at right now that it still will take us quite a few years to actually discover everything that we've uh, looked at in this region. So this right here is actually the only region that we investigated with Kepler mission and, um, and it's located right here in the Cygnus constellation and you can actually see uh, the specific region it was looking at. Now um, overall, so all of this data was simply collected as a raw data and even today, scientists are continuously discovering new planets and new um, objects that we didn't really know existed there because of new uh, techniques of data analysis. So in a sense, we have the data. We don't really need to continuously look at this particular uh, part of space. But what we do need now is new data analysis techniques that will actually make uh, the process of analyzing data much easier, much more convenient and way, way faster, but also more precise. Because the data that we've received from the telescope up to date um, is still actually not really entirely processed. We're actually still actively discovering new exoplanets and uh, new techniques with artificial intelligence trying to analyze the data allowed us to discover even more exoplanets that we didn't really notice the first time. So all of this together actually creates an opportunity for a new, more exciting mission using new sensors, new data analysis, and obviously new telescopes. So in that sense, even though Hubble Telescope will definitely still serve us for quite a while, Kepler Telescope is officially finished. Oh, and by the way, in this uh, particular simulation known as NASA's Eyes uh, Visualization, you can even see the cone of detection from Kepler. This is the actual area we've been looking at. And look at how little it is in comparison to the rest of the galaxy. So even though the Kepler uh, itself has achieved quite a lot, We've only literally scratched the surface here. We've only seen a tiny, tiny part of all of these stars um, relatively close to our own solar system. And even though this was like over 150,000 stars we were looking at, we didn't really even discover 1% of all of the stars near us. So lots of discoveries ahead, lots of new exoplanets we'll be able to see. and. Kepler is definitely going to be uh, kept in memory as one of the more successful uh, initial telescopes. But I'm sure we're going to have a lot of new telescopes coming out in the next few decades that will beat this uh, record by a huge margin. And hopefully in the next few decades, we'll have this whole sphere covered with various exoplanets we discover. And anyway, if you actually want to learn more about the Kepler mission, do check out this free simulation from NASA. It allows you to kind of not just uh, study and learn about what Kepler found, but um, visualize and uh, visit those places by directly clicking on them. You can visit pretty much every single exoplanetary system we've discovered, and you can even see the types of planets we've found in each of them uh, by using this really, really cool simulation. So in here, 
This is the planet we've discovered, a Neptune-like planet known as Kepler-648b. And on that note, and also on this beautiful site of Kepler-10, we're going to finish this video here, and hopefully now you know why we're not really going to be sending any missions to a Kepler telescope to refuel it, because it's expensive, we don't really have the necessary technology, and it's much cheaper, more convenient, and also more efficient to just launch a new telescope and to have it observe stars using new lenses and new technology that we have today. Other than that, I hope you learned a lot from this video, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. And if you did, don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and maybe even consider supporting this channel on Patreon, because it does help me a lot. I'll see you guys tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else about something you may have not known before. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.